you hear me all right? Good, good, good. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah. 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 My name is Kyle Cherick, and I host a television show on uh, PBS called Wisconsin Foodie. How many of you are familiar with it? Great. Never good. seen it. Good. I know. Not at all. You've been on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to my right is Chef Justin Carlisle, uh, owner of Ardent, uh, Laughing Taco, and Red Light Ramen, and a four-time James Beard nominee for Best Chef Midwest, and a graduate of Madison College. Welcome to the Madison College Chef Demo Cooking Series. We are in the Truex uh, Culinary Theater, and this is the first of eight. Uh, this year, we've got chefs on Justin's Caliber, chefs that have been nominated or won the James Beard multiple times. Top chef chefs. Yeah, one I used to work for. One that you used to work for. Yeah, yeah one that I would consider, uh, and a baker that I would consider probably the, well, preeminent baker, really, in America, even though he came from France. Uh, but, you know, that's where they grow good bakers. They do. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to sit down and have a conversation first. If any of you are familiar with my, uh, with my web series, Chef Talk, I did this for years where I would have these candid conversations with chefs about their craft, about their art, about their path. And then we're going to pull these chairs out of the way and we're going to do a cooking demo. And uh, through the magic of culinary schools, I believe you will all be served portions of the exact same thing that Chef is, is cooking, yeah. yeah. I'm not going to come with not free food. <laughs> not. I know better than that. So Jeff, uh, Chef Justin Carlisle, for me, is the perfect blend of the 21st century American chef. He, uh, he embodies what we all, at least those of us in the culinary world and those that followed it, loved most about the great Europe European chefs where they would take flavor profiles, flavor memories, and ingredients from the place that they were from, and very specifically the place they were from. Things that could only be found within a 50 mile radius, uh, and certainly things that could be found within the region. They take those memories primarily from childhood, and then they, uh, it's a form of um, alchemy really, alchemize it into a new style of cooking, a new way of thinking about food, and a new way of presenting those flavors. But they're all rooted in something that seems incredibly honest, seems incredibly familiar, and is incredibly genuine. That's what his cuisine in Arden represents, uh, not just for me, but for food writers across the country, for the James Beard Foundation, uh, and the folks that judge these sorts of things, and for the customers that now have been coming for five years. It will be five years next week. Next week, yeah, yeah. yeah. When I first sat down with Justin uh, for my Chef Talk series, uh, it's, it's worthwhile checking out that, um, this is not a pitch because we've shut the series down. But, um, it's worth checking out. It's always a pitch, Kyle. <laughs> that interview, if you like this one, because I sat down with him for the second time in his career, but just when Arden had been open for eight days. Yeah. And for those of you that haven't been, Arden is a subterranean restaurant, meaning you walk down the steps. It's a really uh, nice word for a basement. Yeah, basement. If you're in real estate, they call those garden apartments. Right. <laughs> Completely. Uh, 23 seats. Yep. Uh, pre six tables, seven six, bar seats. Yeah. Prefix menu. The kitchen is exposed, but not in an open bistro kind of concept. Monikers like molecular gastronomy or modernist cooking or those sorts of things are bandied around the style of cuisine that Justin puts forth, but I think none of them are exactly accurate. They just really sort of touch on the style of his cooking. So uh, how did you arrive at that style of cooking after your path? And I'll give you all a little insight on his path once we get but I want this guy to start talking. Uh, I mean, I got, got to it because it was uh, childhood memories. Um, I think a lot of it was, you know, I grew up uh, north of here about an hour and a half, a small town called Sparta um, up by La Crosse. Anybody from Sparta? Come on. Woo! Woo! Right on! Yes. Um, but, and I grew up on a, on a small beef farm, uh, and it was kind of, I know we always say that my grandmother and my parents were cool, if they would have been going now because we fermented everything, we pickled everything, <laughs> it was called necessity to us, right. like we needed it to live. But there was all of these memories that I had and procedures that I had that as I went through my colony training and traveling in school here and traveling out about is you would get these flavor profiles and you would get these certain notes and tastes and it never like connected back to the way home was for me. Um, and you know, growing up, in the 90s and 2000s in the restaurant world was you were flying in foie from France, you were flying in 
you know, the prongs from Spain, and it was all these gorgeous, wonderful things. But what the hell was wrong with right. what I got from Wisconsin? Yeah. Because we ship all of our stuff out to those countries. So it was trying to replicate, you know, growing up in this enriched agriculture community and state, uh, why weren't chefs utilizing, say they were at that, at that time, it was, you know, the Thomas Keller days and everything mm -hmm. when he was going. Mm -hmm. And now it was, you know, California cuisine and all these states were representing in New York and upper New York. What was wrong with the Midwest? What was wrong, you know, by all means we're steak and potatoes, but you yeah. know, asp asparagus doesn't grow year round. Sorry, everybody, it only grows <laughs> in the summertime. So to bring back those flavors, but also try to do it in a fun way, a relaxing mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. um, an interesting way, my childhood isn't like anybody else's childhood that comes into the restaurant. But if my dish can make something spark in your mind or some sort of thought or a homey feeling or a happy feeling or a pleasant feeling within right. you or create a memory that brings back from a certain time period, that's part of it. That's why, you know, makes something a little bit better and now you're making a connection with the diner that you aren't before when you are just, you know, there's the restaurant breaks of do you have a nutrients restaurant, like you're just going to get subsidence? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to have a dining experience or have a moment with a significant other? Um, but you want to be somewhat a part of it, but you want them to bring back memories and you want them to think about children, the childhood, or they might have went out on their anniversary last year and went to France or somewhere, somewhere else and now they had this, but now all of a sudden this smells like the beach that they right. were on or something. Right. That you want to be able to connect that. And for me, I want to be able to connect that, but also connect it in a way that I can explain to them how I grew up. What I liked about your restaurant in the early days uh, was the temerity of it. Um, it, was, it was a restaurant on your terms. So you had X amount of seats. It was prefix. And uh, I remember talking to you about a cocktail event that was going around the city and I was a part of. And, you know, I wanted Arden to be part of it as well, to get more people in there. And you said, well, we don't do cocktails. Yeah. We, we don't, like, it, it wasn't a... I think we have five now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. but it was like, well, don't, thanks for calling, friend, but that's not... That's not uh, what we do. I don't care if you're going to bring 60 new people to my restaurant. That's not what we do. It is. We're, we're uncompromising in this. And I didn't really understand it until I came and had one of your dishes, the, the tartare that's been on the menu. Since day one. Yeah, and I hope it never leaves. And, you know, we all, I think, as diners, uh, hope to have that, that ratatouille moment, right? You remember the moment in the film where he has the soup and then, you know, he's suddenly six again and, and his grandmother is ladling it out or however that scene played out. And uh, I had that over your tartare. But it was, it was, I know how complex that building of flavors is. Sure, you know, and it's, it goes back to the, the memory and a lot of people have that. Has anybody had a cannibal sandwich growing up? Does anybody know what I mean on cannibal sandwiches? There you go, see? Yeah, 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 yes, thank you. So I grew up on cannibal sandwiches. I was terrified of this thing, like, you want me to make a sandwich out of a bowl of raw ground beef, right. shaved onions. We had Wonder Bread, we weren't very high class. We didn't have rye or whatever else it was. Yeah. No, and I was the youngest of three boys, so my two older brothers would One pick of which who also went to Madison College and graduated from here and is yep. still cooking. Yes, yeah. yes he is. Uh, so the dish came about is I would take the raw beef and put it on my grandma's deviled eggs, and that way I wouldn't have to taste the beef, and I'd just, <laughs> I'd just eat it really fast. Uh, but that's how it came about, how the dish came about. And we serve it there, but it's the discussion, and it's the connection, but it's the place and time. Maybe I'm part of some of the last generation got served cannibal sandwiches. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. people my age and a little bit younger than me, they don't like a lot of the things that a lot of traditional families in this state grew up with or eating or heritage that we grew up with. Right. You know, and to me it was how do I bring back a lot of the way that our area was founded and the heritages that were here, whether you're you know, Norwegian or higher Scandinavian or Polish or German, uh, Northern European, but most of that was what landed here. Most of the people that eat in Milwaukee, especially now, we've, we're losing a lot of that. Right. You know, and how can we bring that back and why can we bring this back? You know, pickled herring's delicious. Uh, you know what I, mean? I agree. Like, uh, and I but, grew up on it at Christmas, but yep. it, yeah, it, it should. But to turn around and to lose a lot of those traditions, but how can I turn around and bring these traditions and flavor profiles and notes and thought processes and pres preservation into a time period that is more modern and show that this wasn't what my grandmother did? You know, sure, it might be the same thought process behind it, but this is what we do now. Yeah. And we do it in a very advanced way and uh, off of old ways. 
you know. So this is a culinary school, and undoubtedly there are culinary students here, and you used to be one. I was. It looks a lot different. Not the best one. <laughs> not the best one. But talk about your path before, uh, because you were cooking as a chef or a chef in development before you came to Madison College. Right out of school, but my middle brother, uh, name is Jason Carlisle, was in culinary school here. Um, he's two years older than me. So he did his you know, summer break externship um, in Wisconsin Dells, which is a wonderful thing for a 16, 17 year old to go with his brother and live in Wisconsin Dells and be an appropriate child in the summertime and not <laughs> do anything bad. Um, but we got away and cooked and prepped and everything else with him and kind of fell into it. And you know, I, where? At Ishnala Supper Club? Ishnala. Yeah. Yeah, how can you leave that out, what? right? I know. Yeah. It's like no place else on no. earth. Yeah. yeah, I did four four summers there. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, now, Eater, I just got a, Eater just reached out and said, what should we, what are we missing in, in Wisconsin next summer? I'm like, well, first of all, have you done Ishnala? Yeah, like, you got to do What's that. What's that? Did you spell something wrong? I'm like, you're idiots. Yeah. That's where you're going to go. Right. This is where yeah. you're going to go. No. You're welcome. This is here. Yeah. So I started there. I mean, outside of in high school, is dishwasher, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I also followed him down to Biloxi, Mississippi. He works for MGM Grand, a lot of the casinos down there. So I moved with him. It was, did a small stint of the military after uh, high school and then followed him down to Mississippi. I was able to go into New Orleans and stage a lot while I was in Mississippi mm -hmm. on the weekends. And then I moved out east. I moved out, I was fortunate enough to get accepted to a resort or a larger in West Virginia called the Greenbrier. Um, and so we were, yeah. I was there for a little while, a couple years. And then I moved up and took um, a short, almost a year stint in New York at a place called Gramercy Tavern. Um, and then I came back to Chicago late 99, right around 2000, uh, right around the, the horrible times of September 11th. I was fortunate, I moved out that night and came to Chicago and started working at True. At True. Rick Tremonto um, and Gail Gaines, well, true. Yeah, Tremonto and Gail Gaines, and I stayed there till 2002, and then I was completely burned out. Thought it'd be a great idea to go to culinary school. So I came here and I went to culinary school. Um, and when I went to culinary school, I also took over and started working in a place in town. At that time, it was called uh, Luther's Blues, Crescent City, yeah. with Nate Herndon. But then on the weekends, I would drive back and still work with Tremano mm -hmm. through my culinary time. Because so you made a commitment to yeah, chef. Yeah, he said that he'd let me go to culinary school if I worked every single weekend and I had to come back to work when I graduated. So he allowed me to do that. So I did that and then I moved back uh, 2004. Worked into late 2005, almost 2006. Moved back to Wisconsin. I took the sous chef job at Harvest. Um, slowly transitioned to be the chef of Harvest. I was the chef of Harvest. You're for... being kind. The exec chef left, and they turned to you and said, "Yeah, it was a great Thanksgiving you're gift." It. But it was a great Thanksgiving gift. But uh, under hey, Justin, come into the meeting. Yeah. yeah, you're the new guy. It's like all right. But under that uh, top organic restaurant in America, food and wine accolades, James Beard accolades, all of that, and uh, I'm just gonna I need to interject in this story because in the years that I've I've been in the food industry and I've watched people on Justin's path, there's there's two ways that chefs well, the, the folks who cook elevate to chef. It's either they, they're ready and they don't have the opportunity and then they finally get the opportunity and they arrive, or they're ready but they don't realize it themselves and the opportunity is flung at them right. and they rise to it. And it only works one of those two ways. There's no in between. Yeah. And I was, you, you had the latter. Yeah, I was not <laughs> ready. I was not ready at all. You, but, but in fact, always, you were. Well, I, you just I didn't think know we, we did it at a good job. To me, it was always like I wanted three answers to every question before I thought, that I could be somebody yeah. else's boss. Right. I didn't have any answers when I became a boss. I still don't have any answers years later. Um, <laughs> I don't. Um, but, and then after that, I worked in the city for a period of time. I helped Shinji open up most of his restaurants. Um, and then I moved 43 back. 43 North. Yeah, 43 North, so. all the Muramotos, yep. Hayes, all of them. Um, and I moved back to Chicago to help a very close friend of mine that I worked with at True, was starting to open up his ventures. His name is Chris Pandell. Um, he's a wonderful friend of mine, and so he started opening up his restaurants. I helped him out, and it kind of came to the period after we got to the, the two restaurants open in two years. He was like, "What are you going to do?" And I was like, "Well, I don't know. I thought I was going to work with you." And he said, "No, you, you're not going to work here. 
you need, <laughs> you, need, you need to leave, friend. I know, which is wonderful because he's like, these aren't your yeah. type of restaurants. I'm not going to keep you here. Uh, so I took a position. I got headhunted by a, a group out of Milwaukee called the Surge Group, and they have a decent amount of restaurants. And I took over their uh, sushi Japanese restaurant. Mm -hmm. And for me, is a, you know, and I can say it now because I believe I've lived in Milwaukee long enough to say this, but before I moved to Milwaukee, I spent a day in Milwaukee, like maybe four hours, <laughs> ever, in my 33 years of existence at that point. Uh, so, you know, I was like, what am I, let's try it out. Um, and yeah, there's the, the wonderful stories and not the wonderful stories of Milwaukee. <laughs> um, I love Milwaukee, I think it's the best city in the world. Uh, so I moved there and took the job with them and roughly after a year and a half, I wanted to call Milwaukee home. Um, I started looking, you know, mm -hmm. I started looking for spaces and what to do. To me, Milwaukee, and it's gonna be the, the cheesy moment at the moment, but to me, Milwaukee talked to me a lot and spoke to me in the sense of it was going through a transition of being an extremely blue collar city. Large industries were big and now they were, they were kind of leaving and Harley was downsizing and yeah. you know, Pickney Spices were downsizing and all these things were happening and it was kind of this uncomfortable setting in the city of what they were going to do and what kind of transition was going to happen. And you saw that as an opportunity. 100%. I saw that as an opportunity to open up a 20-seat tasting menu-only restaurant in one of the biggest blue-collar cities in the United States. Uh, <laughs> and redefine fine dining right, for the entire you know, city and, and part, of the, part of the region. And listen, everybody call me crazy. Yeah. But, and it was, because to me, it's at least this is the only time period that they will give me a chance. They will try it. Right. There is uncertainty in the city. I'm uncertain. They're uncertain about me. They're going to at least try it. What, I, what I like about your career trajectory that always impressed me as a student of, of culinary history is that every time you got comfortable in a position, with the exception of where Chris told you to leave, right. but in every other situation, you left. Yep. You got comfortable, you, you, you gained a certain acumen, you said, now I understand this, I understand this discipline, I'm not a master at it, but I get it. Right. And then you went to some other place where in many cases, you were- It was completely different. You were here on the totem pole, you went down here yep. and had to work your Started way up. all over again. So few of any of us in any profession, in any situation, are willing to do that. And cooking is about 78% hard work and, and then the rest is art. For sure. So, and for the young culinary kids here, that didn't mean that I worked there for three months and then left. Right. Um, <laughs> just, just so anybody knows that it, if you learn how to cook a steak, it doesn't mean that you're good at your job and you can leave. <laughs> um, you know, these were years at a time and there were commitments. Um, you know, with Tremano, that ended up being a, a six year commitment. Yeah. Uh, and it was, you know, not signing papers or anything else, but you give people your word. Um, you go to a place and they hire you and it's not, you know, times are changes and we don't need to go on the, the ramp of the world is different these days, but you know, at those times, you had to work at least a year, mm -hmm. a minimum of a year, um, if not longer. If you didn't make it to your year, then you better not say that you worked Did for you that work person there? because if they called that person, then I'd be, I don't know who you're talking about. Then hang up the phone. Um, you know, and there's still people that do that, but that was the time period of the, what we're talking about. Um, and it was maybe a different world kitchen-wise there, and it was, it was hard. And you know? Tr Tremont, Rick Tremonto, to give some context for those of you that, that may not know, so he, he and his uh, then wife, Gail Gand, opened up True, uh, and Richard Melman, the great restaurateur, Let Us Entertain You, was, was, the, was the bank for it. But with True, he and Charlie Trotter and Rick Bayless put Chicago on the map as an international city of food, and I think America's preeminent city of food. Yeah. If you don't have the three of them, you don't have that American culinary history. If you don't have Rick Tremonto, then you don't have Grant Ackett's. It goes, he worked for Rick, then he worked for Thomas Keller, and then he came back and opened Alinea. So to have that relationship for six years, for sure. and to, to, when I called Rick to do this <clears throat> series, and he'll be cooking here, his second question was, is Justin doing it? And, and I said, yeah. We've stayed in touch. You know? yeah. I mean, he's been somewhat of a father figure a lot of times. Yeah. Somebody to call or you know, the relationship to have. Um, and it was definitely the, the time period of, and I think it was the last time period of, it was the large brigade systems. And it was, you know, to me, it was still the nicest kitchen I ever walked into. Like, you know, we had Versace plateware on the wall, and all, you know, it, but it was that there grand were. kind of sort of fine dining still um, of that time period. Uh, and, but also that grand fine dining time period and those kitchens made me open up a restaurant like Ardent. Right. That is 20 seats 
We don't have any tablecloths. You sit down and it's a napkin and a water glass. The kitchen is quiet. I don't have any wait staff. The people that cook the food turn around and grab the food and walk out to the table and talk to the people at the table and discuss them with the food. We roughly have two, ser two servers, front of the house people, hosts, sommeliers, beverage. But outside of that, everybody's trained to do every job and everybody switches every job every night and everybody swatches over it. And that way, depending how service goes, if you need an espresso, the guy might be roasting your duck and he's gonna walk six feet down the line and make somebody an espresso and turn around and take it to somebody and go back and finish roasting his duck. But to me, that transcends what I grew up with that I didn't want anymore. I don't want a big restaurant. I didn't want too much loss in translations to having too many employees, such a large service. When anybody in Toronto can probably vouch, you can ask him when he's here. If you yell at me, I work slower. <laughs> it's the way I was, and he knew it too. You know, he yelled at me a lot. Uh, uh, you know, but it, and it was. You know, what I mean, it's, I didn't. I wasn't a person. And, and yes, you know, that's times are different. There was. You could hit people in the kitchen at those days and it was perfectly legal and it was fine and nobody's gonna sue anybody. Um, you know, you're afraid you're gonna lose your job. But uh, those were the time periods that I grew up in that I didn't want. You know, mm -hmm. at, at Ardent and you can vibe and some of the people here have been there. It's quiet, it's nice. We play whatever music we wanna listen to. We kinda watch the diners and see if they start dancing or not. Do, are they jumping in their chair or not? If not, then we move the music around. We do this, we try mm -hmm. to do, dishes that bring back childhood and nostalgic or pretty well known for the area. The same amount of those dishes as dishes that are completely off the wall and you're gonna look at me like I'm crazy. But to try to expand the palate. Um, and we're in a lower level, you get away from the city, there isn't, it's very intimate and very warm and it is, it is like you're walking into somewhat my living room or my little apartment and you get away from the world and that's what you do for now. You know? The thing that I always loved about Arden, uh, and I didn't understand it at first, but I, I got this from the very first time, was how honest it was. And, and to me, that's the highest compliment you can pay anybody's food. Uh, and it was the cuisine, because there were flavors that I understood intuitively, that was for sure. But your mom made the aprons. When, yeah, in the, in the, there's, earlier, a of, there's a lot of... Yeah. In the it's, early, a lot of, it's a lot of homie. It's free labor, right? right. It's, my, it's my mother. I mean, she early, can't say no to me. It's my mom. No. In the early uh, days, there were there were throw blankets because he opened it. You know, in the there. colder months, that that you, you you know you could throw across your lap if you were chilly. Well, my wife d doesn't ever pass up a good throw blanket, so we we still have two at home. Yeah. Um, stole them. Yeah. Totally. yeah. Oh, to stone cold. Yeah. Stole them. From that experience, the environment and and then the cuisine, there was no artifice to it. Though it was still fine dining, right. it was prefix. I was being taken on a journey. There were times when I might not even really understand the journey, but I didn't care because I was I was like in I was in good hands, and it's the same experience that people talk about when they you know they'll go to Europe and they they eat a three Michelin star place, but it's somewhere way out in the country, and you order a trout and the chef goes out and catches it in the stream, yeah. uh, and the tablecloths. Uh, you know, they're all white, but they're slightly different shades of white because that's how they roll. Right. And for yeah. me, it was more, I love where I grew up. Like, I love Wisconsin. I love where I grew up. I love as hillbilly as my family is. They're awesome. And I love the way that I grew up. And I don't think that I always treated my parents the best sleep growing up. But all of this, when it was time for me to open up a restaurant or have, that, have the chance, you know, and I opened it off of necessity and chance. Um, it had to be a part of it, and it's a family. It's the same way that I feel about my employees. We are a family. I'm not the boss at the restaurant. They're the boss, I listen. Yeah, we want Afghans over the chairs. We want people to feel comfortable. Um, we had it set up, and you remember, the restaurant's set up in like two different structures. So the entire front of the restaurant's completely fogged over. You can't see in the restaurant. There is no menu you can look up online. There is nothing that we ask you outside of, make your reservation and tell me what you're allergic to and what you don't like. And outside that, you walk up to the restaurant, it's downstairs in a basement of an old apartment building, you can't see inside of it, so everybody has no idea what they're walking into. So the people are uncomfortable the minute they walk in, you know, they don't know what they're getting themselves into walking into the restaurant. Then all of a sudden you walk in and it's extremely warm colors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this warm glow of the kitchen in the background, it's everybody's still, you know, I'm not, too far of a child yet, we still dress for work. 
Uh, we wear chef coats and uniforms. The two front house staff is extremely, you know, diverse and soft voices. We Google everybody. Yes, if you come in, we Google you. We try to find out if it's anything special you didn't tell us. We try to find out other places that you've dined lately, where you've been. If these you've types written of a things. bad Yelp review about. <laughs> I gave up Yelp years ago. It's I'm fine. Kidding. I don't I'm like kidding. It. Uh, but we want to know because we're going to spend two and a half hours with you. We want to be able to have points of conversation, of connection, um, but also know points of likes and dislikes and try to gauge this before you come in. Um, and then you sit down and we start out with, and we still uh, we have like this little cheese puff. Um, we have snacks when we start out with. And it's been on there, and it's beer cheese soup. But what we do is we take like a Gougere style and we make Gougeres, um, and then we pretzelize it, make this hollow out pretzel, and then we fill the inside of it with beer cheese soup and put cheese over the top. And everybody gets it and they think like, what is this thing? It's really weird. But the minute they eat it, you know, 99.9% .9 of it people start sense. laughing. Yeah. They smile. All of a sudden they go from this to this. <laughs> you know, and pretty soon now all of a sudden the trust factor comes in and now they're relaxed. Um, and then we go throughout the mm -hmm. meals and there's dishes like that and there's not dishes like that. But these were all parts of, to me growing up in the industry, there was a lot of that to me that lacked. Like mm. we did wonderful things and we took care of stuff, but if this gentleman that is in this beautiful suit in this iron white tablecloth is gonna come up to me and tell me how I should eat it with my left hand and pull up and do this three times or no. Yeah, you know, and they're paying I, for that. Yeah, they pay a lot of money for yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want that. I just wanted something really relaxed and comfortable, and but yet my way. Right. Then. Yeah. Well, right. uh, the last comment before we start this demo is when uh, I talked to you years ago when you were looking for spaces and you were on your quest, and I said, uh, I get it. You know, a lot of chefs want their own restaurant, but like, what's your real reason? And you didn't even miss a beat. You said, I want to serve my dad's beef yeah. in my own restaurant. Yeah. And I thought, there's yeah. no finer answer than well, come that. Come on, I grew up on a beef farm. If yeah. I didn't serve my dad's beef, I'd come and be a jackass. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's like, I love a wonderful chef, grew up on a beef farm, doesn't serve anything that his parents make. Right. Uh, but no, it, you know, my father and I grew up this, and we grew up. The, the small farm mentality, you know, I was in FFA and I showed cows and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all of this type of stuff, you know, this is how I grew up and what more pride than to turn around and now my mother knits all of it and makes my aprons and every of the little, you know, napkins that you get she makes and, and we have And your dad a, sends you invoices. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there was, there was an agreement on the first drop off of beef and I was like, hey, it's because you're my dad, if you send me shitty stuff, I'm sending it back. And he's, <laughs> And he's like, I know I raised you. It's going to be perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> but no, to be able to do that. But there's also this sense, and maybe we're getting a lot more in dining now than we did years ago, but there's a sense of place and sense of story. You want to have a connection. You know, there was always things when I lived in Madison and would run the farmer's market, I remember there, we'd always make a connection. That we'd have cooks that, you know, they would burn beets, and I would make them save the beets. And then next week when the farmer comes, I'd tell the cook, go get the burnt beets, go tell the farmer what you did. You know, show to the guy that just grew all the beets that mm -hmm. you roached them in the oven and tell him that you're sorry. You know, and because this guy just spent how many months right, doing this. Right, cherishing and these And you didn't believe in setting a timer and you burned them. Um, but now to do that and now for me, I'm very proud of where I grew up. I'm very proud of my family and what we did and I want to show that. And I want people to eat it. And I want people also to know that there is this that exists in our state. There is these type of farmers that exist in our state. And our state is quite outstanding and wonderful for what we do. And these are prime example of it. And you don't have to get beef imported from Japan or anything right. to be a right. fine dining, elegant restaurant. You can get beef from a hillbilly in Sparta <laughs> that's really good. Uh, for a yeah. lot less, yeah. but you can't really because it only comes to me. But uh, <laughs> but you know, the, but there are those farmers in there, and we have them, you know, around Madison especially, and over by where I grew up, and by Milwaukee, is they're out there. Go outside the city and find out, mm -hmm. you know, and find them, use mm -hmm. them. Well, let's, uh, let's we gonna, make some potato soup. Oh yeah, it is. It's gonna yeah, be it's, it's gonna, gonna be fancy be, potato it's soup. Be good. Yeah.
All right, some of the ingredients we have, for the most part, done. So I'll walk you through what is in them and how we did it. Uh, we are going to start out by warming up the cream. Do you know how to work this thing? So these are Volrath induction burners, and we have to thank Volrath, which is this Thanks, great... Thanks, Volrath. Yeah, 140-year-old Wisconsin company. They're, they're one of the giants in kitchenware, uh, pots, pans, amazing appliances. And um, they came in for this series and said, we want to help take it to another level. Uh, we want to be in touch with these chefs. We want to support the culinary school. We totally get it. And basically said, whatever you need. So this is some of their equipment. They've been a delight to work with. And uh, I know you probably agree as well, but the fact that a Wisconsin company that's got that kind of heritage in cooking, I called and they were like, yep, you stop talking, we're in, we're good. We right. want to be and there. We, you, know, you think about it and it's outside of our farming community and our communities restaurant wise, but a lot of things, at least in our community that we use, is made in made, this state. Made right here. Catco, yeah. Alto Sham, Volrath. Right, yeah, Lodge, on and on. And on. Yeah. But they're made here. Use them. It's My wonderful. dad sold West Bend cookware door to door in the 60s. He's lying. No, he did. You could actually make a living doing that in those days, too. Right. Now they'd arrest you. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, this is an induction burner. And, and uh, one of the cool things about Ardent um, that we have to talk about is that you've already discerned if you haven't been, it's a very small restaurant, it's subterranean or garden apartment. But uh, it's not a traditional kitchen setup in that there are no hoods. So everything is induction burner. Everything is combi yeah. oven. Everything so all, is all of my restaurants are all electric. Um, and only one of them has a hood. Uh, so the taco shop has a hood. Yeah, for tacos. Stop filtering for tacos, yeah. Yeah, you got um, it. Yeah. So I am more realm in these. And I'm a little more scared of that. <laughs> uh, that's hot. No, uh, <laughs> but it is. For us, um, it was... And we discussed it a little bit earlier, so if anybody heard it earlier or not, but it was off necessity. You know, I, I found the space that I liked and I enjoyed, and it was down in a, a lower level in a basement, and we brought in, and kind of remember seeing it right away, and we gutted it out and got it nice, and we're starting to design where things are going to go, and all this, by all means, I didn't have a designer. Like, we're talking cheap on the cheap. Um, but, so we're looking around, and I bring in a guy to put a hood in, and we measured it out and everything else, and it's five-foot hood. He's like, okay, so you know, we're gonna have to go up seven stories roughly, and we're gonna have to, I don't know how many concrete walls we're gonna have to go through, and this and this to do it. So, you know, ballpark at least 150,000, not more for your five foot hood. It's like, <laughs> it's like, so how about those induction burners? This, <laughs> this is gonna be really great. This is gonna be wonderful. Uh, we ended up not doing the hood. <laughs> Um, and all set in when we opened up Ardent, we spent $65,000 total to open up the whole restaurant compared to a hundred everything dollars. plates, light bulbs, like all of it, all of it, everything in for just roughly over 30%. Yeah. 40%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we use these all ele electric all the way across the board, circulators, and, electric ovens. And in your style of cooking induction and the control that you have. I think is probably key, right? It is, yeah. yeah. Our style of cooking is more organization and control um, than maybe hot and hot heat and fast. Yeah. Uh, you know, all of ours is strategically scheduled and time out throughout the day. And it is often necessity too. We, we finally have an oven. When we opened up our and we only had a toaster oven. Uh, it was a tabletop toaster oven. So we had to time out. We had to organize the schedule on because when they made bread, like we're, we couldn't use the oven for like two and a half hours. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just the way it was. A little panel is yeah, you, yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. When we bread, made exactly. bread service yeah. every night, so it was like two and a half hours every afternoon. <laughs> Nobody can use the oven. So uh, it was a lot of timing out. So to give you, uh, to give you all, if you haven't been, I, I don't know, this space to about here to there, in here. We could do this whole thing from, is it, this a garage door? Yeah. Yeah. From this whole slab? is the size of Arden. Right. 900 square feet. Right. Yeah. And, and this it's would, my this largest would, restaurant. This would be the kitchen the space. Yeah. And the kitchen space is roughly 75 square feet. And you have three chefs on? Four? Uh, five, including the dishwasher. OK. So on a Friday night service, yeah, we're getting fancy now. We're, yeah. up, to, we're up to like nine employees. So we have nine employees for 36 people. Um, yeah. It's a lot of work, though. Yeah. Um, and it, to go back to the restaurant, it's kind of like having the, the fine dining down to details without feeling that you're fine dining down to details. Like we have cell phone holders that my mom made. 
Right. Um, yeah, the little pedestals that sit up for the cell phone. Um, yeah, we have two sommeliers now. We physically have people that just polish silverware. Stand around, we have a person that hides by the bathroom and opens the door and closes the door and takes your coat and all no, these no, kind no, of no, all no, these kind of all these kind of amenities, but it's not it's not an I don't want mean it's not an intrusive amenity. It's we want to make sure that when you come to dine, you're there to enjoy your suffering, there not to worry about anything else. And that is also the play of when you sit down, there isn't a menu. Yeah. You never see a menu until you walk out the door. We give you the menu when you leave. You never see a wine list unless you ask for it. You never see anything unless you physically, we yeah. talk about it and have a discussion about and it. how many days are you open a week? Four. Four. We also have, we, to go on, are we still good talking? Or do yeah. you want me to get a cook? All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm also in this whole philosophy that my industry doesn't need to kill anybody else anymore. Um, we are normal people. We should be respected like normal people. Well, that's we asking all, a lot. I know a lot of it, you. It is. That's, you know, I mean, to me, and I, I've calmed down a little bit, maybe in the five years since you met me. A little, used to be a little more boisterous. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I would get in arguments with people. You know, I would, we had a dentist come in, and he wanted to come in at like five o'clock, and we open up at six o'clock. He's like, oh, yeah, can I come and have a drink at the bar at five? And I was like, that'd be great, but we open up at six. And he's like, well, yeah, but you have a bar. I can come and have a drink. I'm like, great, can I have my teeth cleaned at seven? He goes, no, I open up at eight. And I was like, yeah, but you can just clean my teeth at seven, right? <laughs> Why not? You know, it's, it's the same factor. Don't disrespect me in my business if we don't. And so I am extremely concerned about my employees. Um, everybody works four days. Even now, the ramen shop is open six days a week, and we have two teams so that nobody works more than 40 hours or four days a week. Um, everybody gets our maternity leave is a minimum of a month paid. Uh, you're not allowed back in the restaurant. Um, we have no set days off. You just write it on a calendar, and all of us take your weight and fill your station, and all of us work that station while you're gone, and you come back and we're fine again. Um, you know, and that goes back to cross training on everything. Um, we're not open to any holidays. We decide two weeks out of the year that we're going to shut down whenever they want to decide and shut down. Um, we just had it last night that my employees came back and like, are we going to be open the day after Christmas? Which you know, ramen shop should be mm -hmm. open. And the day after Thanksgiving, I was like, well, do you guys want to be? And then two of them were like, well, I'm seeing my parents. I'm like, okay, we're closed. You know, we're, then we're done. You guys stay in with your family. Um, we pay well, mm -hmm. very well. You do. Um, A living wage. Uh, for sure. Base pay. Yeah. Uh, and not to, my dishwasher roughly makes about thirty thirty five thousand dollars $35,000 a year. Um, everybody, that's about why, why we don't have wait staff because now I can split tips legally between everybody and now they get a 30% hike or raise yeah. in, their, in their wage. So we give them a, an hourly or salary um, and then they're based off that, but their base is right around 30, 33,000 dollars a year and then uh, their tips on top of that and then my managers are in, not to get too many, but in the 50s to 60, high 60 ball parks for working four days a week. And they have a choice to work another job. Um, same with the taco shop is the same philosophy. You know, I always laugh because uh, we're five days a week, but two teams, lunch and dinner. <laughs> so nobody works over 40 hours a week. Um, and then they're started out at roughly about $13 an hour plus tips. Uh, so it comes out to being about $20 an hour to work at my taco shop. And I should mention, so Justin's wife, three years now? Uh, we're going on. Four, four, yeah, four, and four a half. okay, uh, is, is Mexican, so yes. he was going to open a taco shop whether he liked it or not. Right. <laughs> She's known me since I was like 15, so yeah, I mean, it's like she knows really, the worst of me. Just, yeah, 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 with your James Beards, but like you just open a taco shop. Right, we need a taco <laughs> shop. Yeah, I always laugh. She's like, they're like, oh, your wife runs a taco shop. I was like, you mean she tells me how to run the taco <laughs> shop because I'm the one there. Yeah. Uh, so right. we're going to make um, aerated potato, fancy potato soup. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to simmer cream, bring it up. We're going to have potatoes. We're going to add it to the cream with garlic, a little bit of thyme. We're going to simmer it and just cook the potatoes in it. The fancy thing of uh, wonderful culinary people here, they cooked the potatoes for me already. It's going to be good. Um, and, for, and these are one dishes, and it goes back to 
Um, a discussion I think we had earlier, right? When you came in and had the brandad. Brandad at your previous restaurant you were working at. Yep, and then we had it a couple times at Arden, but yeah. so brandad traditionally is a salt cod spread for the most part, a lack of getting into too in depth. Uh, made with uh, potatoes and lots of garlic. Yeah. And what we would do is extremely similar to this, would take cream and garlic and potatoes, uh, steep it, cook it, throw in the salt cod, strain it and make like a, a thickened cream out of it. And then we put it in these little fancy things and a lot of people see it like Starbucks when they get that little frothy top on. Um, but we put it in there and then we charge it and aerate it and it comes into like this really rich soft custard. Um, and that's what we're gonna do is we're gonna make it out of potatoes. Um, and then a friend of mine introduced me to this seasoning method of using uh, yeast, fresh yeast. So we take fresh yeast, crumble it up, throw it in the oven, bake it, caramelize it, dehydrate it, turn it into a salt. We you do all a, do that at home, right? Oh, yeah. 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 We do a lot of weird stuff that isn't. <laughs> it sounds like it's natu it is natural to me because we live in the environment. But, yeah. um, and we use it for seasoning. It almost has like this cheese quality to it. Uh, so we'll use it to seasoning. So that's going to be part of it. Um, to go along with the dish while this is warming up, watch it because it's going to boil yeah, over. Yeah, no, 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 we're at 220. Uh, it's going to be uh, a relish that we're going to make. We do a lot of preservations at Ardent, um, a lot of different kinds of preservations kind of on that whole yeast subject that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, we do our natural pickling. We do natural brining. I've been fortunate enough in the travels and time periods and chefs that have come in to work with a lot of individuals that do a lot of R&D and do strictly things that are doing. There's a gentleman out in Berkeley called uh, Kevin. He has a shop called The Cultured Pickle. Um, he is, in my mind, on his own planet. Um, <laughs> he is the forefront of anything that is happening preservation-wise. He's been doing it for 20 to 30 years, and he just has jars still hanging out. Like He just walks up and wow. tastes something like, 22 year old like watermelon rind and sake leads or whatever what we do and I'm just like how do you like I just want to see what happens you know it's, <laughs> he smokes a lot of weed he's in Berkeley uh, <laughs> he's in Berkeley there's a right? tax deduction practically right. um, yeah <laughs> so we learned a lot from him and we've been introducing a lot of he uses sake leads or a leftover mash of rice after you make sake I um, mean he just buries vegetables in it and he'll let them go but for years at a time or one year or two year. Uh, we get a lot of stuff from him, but through him, we do live in Milwaukee and we drink a lot of beer in Milwaukee, so why can't I use beer mash? So we turn around and we do a beer mash and we figured out how to make a level out of beer mash and helping the salt levels and that kind of stuff. Um, so he's like, it's boiling. There it goes, um, isn't that induction cool? Uh, we Volrath. started using a lot of that <laughs> in it, but we also dehydrate everything. We jar everything, we brine everything, um, different salt levels, different kind of takes. We have in the summertime, four to five 22 cameras in the refrigerator at all times of different brines and pickling and everything else. And that way, everything that comes in, we take eight bottles, put them all in, ladle, 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 close it, put it up on the shelf. Hmm. Uh, we make salts out of almost everything. You'll find out later, we'll get to it, we make ash out of everything mm -hmm. um, and use that as seasonings. So we try to preserve everything, and everything to me has a moment in time that it's taken, but then everything is from here, so even now if you're seasoning it with a salt that's made out of burnt onions, the burnt onions come from my father, and we do this, and right. keep, uh, it, keep it going. You know? One of the cool things about Ardent that's different than pretty much every other restaurant in the state, I think probably you have to get to L Ideas in Chicago or a few other places around that do this, but Justin has a visiting chef or chefs from other restaurants around the country that he pays to come in, fly in, put them up, cook. So you get a one-off unique dinner that happens in Arden once a month. And then he goes and travels uh, probably once a month, if not more. Almost, yeah, it's yeah. every other week right now. Yeah, to their restaurants as well. So. If you think about how the world has gotten much bigger and much smaller with globalization and the internet, and we really are, you know, we're bifurcating into, well, we're way more than bifurcating, we're multifurcating into all these tribes. If you're interested in this, you can find someone in Iceland that also has the same hobby, and, you know, Japan and so on and so forth through the internet. With chefs, it's a practical art, right? So you have to travel, you have to cook together, you have to pollinate in kitchens. And I love that, that he created this network 
from the get go yeah. that it's expensive, but one hundred percent. Like we try to make zero. As long as I make zero money by bringing this guy here or this woman here, outstanding. Yeah. Um, to me, and it got to the point, and I think that you know it goes with our times are changing. There is now more camaraderie within us as an industry, and there's more help. We want to talk to individuals more. We want to learn from people. Um, I think there was too much time, and there was when I grew up, that when you opened up your restaurant, it was your restaurant, and you're better than everybody else, and everybody else can go whatever cuss words you want to put in my mouth at the moment. Um, you know, and you ran this, and you were a tyrant, and this is the way that it was. It's not. It was stupid. Because that means that you're not going to get any better. You're not going to train anybody any better. And the only person that you are wonderful in, around, is yourself and your own four walls. Because everybody that comes in leaves and doesn't feel the same way. Guaranteed. To us now, yep. And to us now, it's a huge family. And there's, we fly people in from, you know, we have James from London that came in. We've yeah. had multiple people from Mexico that's come up. Uh, one of them I do it because I feel that I couldn't go and stage anymore or trail or spend time in other people's kitchens because now I have my own restaurant. So how do I learn from somebody I want to learn from? Well, guess what? If you give them some money and you put, give them a plane ticket, they usually go about, we go anywhere. Like <laughs> as, long, as long as you pay for us to go somewhere, we'll go. Um, so you bring them. But I, and I also wanted to, I love Milwaukee, and I wanted these people that, A, have never been to Milwaukee. They've never been to Wisconsin. They don't know what outside of Chicago is. I want them to come. They fly in on Friday or Saturday. I take them around the city. I show them the city. I take them outside the city. We'll drive all the way up to the farm if they want to. We'll go come to Madison. We'll go to the farmer's market. Um, I take them out to eat to different places. And if they drink, we go out to bars. And if they don't, we go to coffee shops. And then turn around and main part for us. And then the night before the dinner, we have them eat at Ardent. And they sit down and I eat with them. You know, If there's one humbling moment that you can have in your life, sit down at your own restaurant and eat. It sounds great when you're in the kitchen, but when you sit down and actually see how your restaurant runs, you start with changing. With a fellow chef. Right, you know, with <laughs> the person you respect. But, and I, yeah. So I eat with them every month. So I eat in my restaurant every month. I bring a new chef in the end of the month because no matter what, if you want to believe a food critic, once you believe a guy that does it every day that sits down at your restaurant and mm -hmm. then will stand up in the next day, you can talk to him and find out how his meal was, what he liked, what seasoning, how his service, how was everything that I do. And now I get a report card every month from somebody that I truly respect that does the same thing that I do. Um, and then the next day, me and my cooks, you know, through this whole time, we get to cook with them. And we get to talk about them. We get philosophies and we learn different things, obviously. And now we can start arbitrating and bringing them into our processes and our ways of life and our home. And hopefully we can share that too. And then when they leave, they like Milwaukee. They know where it is. We have now have a relationship. If I have a question to ask, I now have another person that is I consider a friend. I can call them if I need something, if I want to learn something, if something happens. Now and pretty soon, all of a sudden, our little chef community in Milwaukee ends up going across the world and across the United States. And now, all of a sudden, it's a better environment that we're creating instead of creating our own little environments and our own little restaurants. Uh, and a lot of these things I learned from these people that came in and cooked, right. um, like the pickling system. So for the relish on this dish, um, we do a green bean relish, or we use a lot of our pickles towards the fall to use them up because we want to get through the summertime to replenish. Yeah, they only have so many jars. So they Remember, the rotate. restaurant's 900 square feet. It's like, where am I going to put it? All right, you know what I mean? Like, I don't have so much room. Um, so the relish is going to be pickled green beans uh, sautéed with a little bit of leeks, or you can use onions, too. Uh, once we cook that down so you get that acidity and add some pickling liquid to it, we use the, the kazuzuki or the sake lead method. Um, we put in a little bit of fermented jalapenos. Uh, the minimum time that we let them sit is about a year. The ones that we use brought, the ones that I brought for you guys are three years old. Um, and then we season it with the jalapenos just to get enough spice to kind of have sweet acidity and spice to it. Um, and then we will take another uh, method, of, to me it was a garlic one. Uh, that we had green garlic stored in the kazuzuki. And I only take the sake leads or the paste that we put it in, and I use them for seasonings later. Um, so I used that as a seasoning and put that in with a little bit of sesame oil um, and just stewed it and cooked it all down until it became an arella. So you get a lot of <coughs> profiles. And you know, for those in the kitchen that taste it, it's like it's all profiles that you know. But as you're making it, it's kind of like, what the hell are you doing? You know, these are a little weird. Because you all cook um, like this at home. You know, it's, it's developing, so that's going to go at the bottom. 
Um, and then for the soup, uh, we'll turn this up a little bit because it should be about ready. Uh, but we're just going to flavor, in theory, the cream and make a real loose potato soup. Um, or make improper mashed potatoes, if you would say. Uh, <laughs> way too much way cream. Way too much. Um, and then we're just going to blend it. So yes, it's going to get loud in a minute. Yeah. Um, just to thicken that cream. And then we're going to season it um, with the roasted yeast that I talked about earlier. Uh, so fresh yeast. A lot of us, how many put nutritional yeast on their popcorn? You all should put nutritional yes. yeast on your popcorn. It's delicious. Um, but it's kind of that same little profile except for times 20. Um, it's just a lot, a lot more powerful and flavorful. So you kind of get these like cheese rind mm -hmm. flavor profile. I mean, most of us know what like baker's yeast smell like. Um, but now you're trying to, it's like you're kind of in a cheese aging room. Um, and we're going to season the cream with that. Um, and put that in the whipped cream canister. What's going to happen is when we put the relish down in the bowl, it's going to come out and it's going to set up like a really super soft custard. Um, and then we are going to take... It's like yes, a potato soup parfait. Yep. And then we're going to take another item. I'm waiting for everybody to look at me. So this is going to be onion ash. Uh, we take all of our onion skins. How's that again? At onion ash. <laughs> uh, and we burn them. We literally roach them and we burn them. Um, and then we take all of our scraps of a lot of vegetables and we caramelize them and caramelize onions and then we dehydrate it. Um, and then we add them together when they're both dry because now you're getting a bitter and a sweet. Mm -hmm. Combine them together. Um, and then we use, there's a mushroom, a mushroom powder you can get at the Asian store. I can't believe I'm telling all you guys my secrets. And the <laughs> mushroom powder you get at the store or there's a, a miso soup base, handashi. Uh, we add that to it. Um, it kind of gives like a fattier, saltier notes to it. So it balances all out. So you kind of get a sweet and a bitter and salt all into it. Um, and we're going to dust the top of the potato with that. Uh, so it's going to be hopefully delicious. Cool. Uh, so we're going to finish this off. Pour it through and strain it, right? Uh, we're going to blend first. And blend, by all oh. means, if you have a question, you can shout at me like this whole me talking and nobody talking Actually, back Actually, if thing, you have you questions, can... hold on to them. Wait until the end because I will come oh, out with that. that up, you huh? did. Sorry. You did. There's AV people that are trying to do their jobs here, Carlisle. Sorry, guys. Uh, I'll come out with the microphone. So if you have a question, don't. You invited don't, me. I, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> don't, well, you picked up my call. Right. That, was the first, that was the first mistake. Uh, don't start talking until I bring the microphone to you. Um, just because this will then be played forward for future culinary students and programs and things like that. So don't listen to anything I said. Just and you all are, yeah, you're all going to have great questions. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to bring this up to simmer. We're going to blend it into the Vita Prep. So pardon the, the loudness for a couple minutes. How many of you know that, how many of you have Cuisinarts at home? Come on, really? You've got to have more. Really? How many of you cook at home? People don't cook at home these days, but how, Kyle. Wait, what do you, how do you cook without a Cuisinart? Kyle, you just started cooking at home like a year ago. I started cooking. I've been, no, I've been dating Nada. We've been married for two. We've been together for seven. I started cooking six and a half years ago. Uh, <laughs> um, I have restaurants. He's lying. <laughs> you know? uh, anyway, little aside, the same folks that make that make the Cuisinart. That's my, yeah, go. Yeah, all right. Hey, it. It's loud. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. I thought it was going to be way louder. Uh, then we're going to put in the seasoning. So salt, pepper, and roasted yeast. So you put that right in. It's, not, it's blended in. It's not Bl dusted in. Yep. So yeah. we'll season it here. Put it back on the blender. I'm trying to do it in front of people, you know. Yeah. Um, and then taste it. Strain, Strain it through. through. Take all the particles out of it. And then put it in those, those fancy whipped cream containers. So one of the reasons that Arden is prefix is that you, you can't, like you can't just, the way that it's set up and being that small of a kitchen and that small of a restaurant is that you can't have, well, if you've got 23 people. Yeah, you we have, tried a la carte and tasting. Yeah. Ooh. Didn't work. It was right. rough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really rough. Yeah. So it's, it's a journey. You're signing up for it. Uh, it's, it's their way. But 
that's the experience. If you don't want that, there's like a thousand other restaurants you can go to where you can have it, you know, the Burger sure. King style. We frustrated because when I opened up, it was we wanted an a la carte menu that I always, you know, grandma can come in and grandma can get whatever grandma wants because she wants to be with the family and the family then can play along with us and get the tasting menu. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it worked out and people are happy, but I think it became less what I wanted, mm -hmm. you know, and less what we envisioned and less personal because we couldn't give the detail to service and everything we wanted because it wasn't feasible. That smells you know, really wasn't, good, by the way. It wasn't feasible. Yeah, that's, that's great. Like um, that's uh, so then was slowly, and it happened, it was like nine months after we opened, we had an eight top in which is half of our restaurant <laughs> almost. <laughs> but uh, we had an eight top that came in and we're like, well, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna drop tasting menus and a la carte menu? Like, this is not gonna this go. This is gonna kill this us. This is not gonna go well tonight. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't drop any menus. And we just asked them what they wanted. Uh, and if they had any allergies or anything like that, and they were all, no, no, we're fine, whatever you want. So we never gave anybody menus after that night. <laughs> I've never heard uh, this yeah, story. Ever, ever again, we're like, it I've worked. I've heard most of his stories. So it was like, it worked. They had eight people, they didn't say anything, they didn't complain, they had a really great time. You should, we're, we're never dropping menus again. You should find, uh, find those eight and write so, them a letter yeah, and just say, right? just so you know, you changed yeah, my business you plan. Thank God. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, and it did, and after we did that, it's, we do, we, and it creates discussion without having the menus, and it, you want to have the interaction um, and we do, we accommodate everybody. We don't, I'm not the chef that says, oh, you're gluten-free or oh, you're vegan. Guess what, you're human. So come in and eat, have a good time. If you're a vegan, you're gonna get exactly the same amount of courses and treat you exactly the same way. Pregnant people, you get, want a beverage pairing? Outstanding, you have a non-alcoholic beverage pairings that are gonna be the same flavor profiles as the wines and everything else that we're distilling or however we can do this to make sure that we can isolate down to have the closest experience that is the same for each individual no matter what your issue is you know it's to me it's mostly it's not anybody's fault that they have allergies they or have are pregnant right or are pregnant yeah. 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 My, I mean, my wife's pregnant right now and i keep saying it's my fault it she's like, like it's, it's not. not i believe there's a lot of people's fault when they get pregnant <laughs> yeah, but, uh, so we're going to finish off the soup otherwise kyle and i often go off on tangents about it <laughs> So in addition to, uh, to Arden, Justin also has Red Light Ramen, which is a ramen restaurant directly across. When you, when you step down the stairs into the basement, you can either go to the right into Arden, where the frosted door is, uh, and you can't see anything in, and the windows are, you know, you're at street level. Uh, so you don't really know what kind of environment you're walking into. But then once you're in that environment, you're very much enveloped by it. Or you can go to the left, and you can go to his ramen restaurant. And the ramen restaurant is really just a continuation of the late night menu that you started doing a month after a month, the open I was going to say really soon, yeah. yeah. And it was a great idea. Basically, uh, the Stupid. Arden would wrap up. <laughs> well, it was it was as great. As long actually. as I've known Justin, he wanted to have a noodle shop, and it was one of those things like you know somebody and they say, yeah, I do this, but I, you know what I really want is I just want to race cars. Sure. And you're like. Okay, it didn't match with anything, but you should get a noodle shop then. So uh, they'd close Ardent, they'd cover the windows over with burlap, they'd lock the door, and then at 11.30, a little small red light would go on. A little motion light outside of Ardent. So yeah. we'd black it all out, and the only lights that were around were in the kitchen. Um, yeah, it was, high, well, it was high class. Burlap sacks over the windows. Every, awesome. every, well, everything switched over. I don't know if anybody knows the east side of Milwaukee really well. But if you put burlap sacks over the east side of Milwaukee at, at 11.30 on a Friday night, well, I understand. you the, don't want to walk down into it, you know? The, <laughs> the windows start right here for the restaurant. Right. Because it's a subterranean restaurant. So then you drop burlap sacks over that, and to let everybody know that you're open again, you put a red light on. Yeah, a red motion yeah. light. Yeah. So. Super smart. Yeah. But what it was was, again, it was a prefix... Uh, no. Ramen. One bowl menu. of ramen. Uh, I believe it was. Two or three. One. Well, you remember. You could do egg, you could do pork belly. You could maybe. That was do... just you. We liked you. Oh, Otherwise, thanks. We, didn't, we didn't give anybody else options. Yeah. It was like it's the epitome of the soup Nazi. Um, you come down, <laughs> it, 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 it was. Uh, <laughs> like, and that was. But then to put it to another point, maybe, and I guess the best way to describe it was we would have ardent. 
that was extremely higher end fine dining. Like we would run down the street to get somebody a Budweiser if that's what they drank at Arden. Like whatever service style that we could have. And we would turn around on Friday and Saturday nights. It started out because we wanted to hang out with the fellow chefs in the city. We didn't want to go out and nothing against the public, but we're tired. Like we don't, we just want to hang out and talk and have a couple beverages and not be bothered. Uh, so we did that. Uh, it grew very fast. Once it started growing, um, we had one soup. That's it. I don't, I, I don't want pork belly. Leave. I don't want, <laughs> but leave. Don't eat here. Go somewhere else. You know, they all of a sudden, they, so we were like the total opposite of extremely strict and not really great hospitality. And if you uh -huh. stayed too long, even as a friend, you were asked to leave anyway, because they yeah. still only had 23 seats. Yeah, so you finish your bowl, and you could either have a slushy, uh, an old fashioned slushy, or a margarita, yeah, or a Pabst. Or and if you're like, if you're gonna hang out like people do in coffee shops, no. you should go to a coffee shop because yeah. we would walk by in a minute that you're almost done with your soup. We'd pick up your soup. Yeah. And then we'd be like, you're done. And they're like, look, it's like you know, you gotta go. Yeah. Like, there's people, there's people in line want to be courteous, and we kick people out. Uh, but roughly about 15, 20 minutes. We ended up doing. Uh, we were open for 90 minutes, and we would do 120 people in 90 minutes. A 23 seat restaurant. Yeah. So that tells you, but it was delicious. And fun. It was so fun. Uh, and I'm not a chef, but I, they're, they're nice to me. They hang around me at times. And so it was great to see uh, a lot of the chefs in the city come at the end of their shift, have something warm, uh, something that filled them up, something that refed their body after they'd basically emptied themselves out to fill other people up for hours on end and catch up on conversations, but there was also a brevity to it because you had to leave in a little while because <laughs> there was a line outside and you wanted you know, Justin and his crew to go home and you wanted them to make a little money and have a great night. And then uh, anyway, it turned into its own beast, which is its own restaurant right across the and aisle. It was, it was fun for us because, I mean, as much as anybody wants to say is that our, our state might be behind the, the culinary times a little bit at certain moments. Um, so a uh, ramen shop was maybe not the first thing. Well, I guess, well, Nila was ardent. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, to have in Milwaukee. So to me, I'm already paying rent on the space. I'm already doing it. So mm -hmm. why not have a ramen shop? Because I want to have one on the hours that I want to have it. I'm not going to lose any money doing it. It's the same employees. Like, I'm not, you know, it's for us. And if nobody likes it, then don't come. Like, we can just hang out and drink beer and drink ramen and... Nobody has to hang out with us. You One know? of the chefs that Justin used to work with in the other restaurant group would leave his fancy pants steak restaurant. He was the executive chef of the Surge Group and he'd come be our dishwasher at night. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it was like hanging with all his buddies and it, honestly, it's like, I just have to wash dishes. I don't have to make any decisions. I don't have to make sure the steaks are temped. Yeah. I don't have to run a 12 person kitchen. I, I, let me help you. It was fun on both sides. Yeah. Because all of our friends, and but it, it brought community together. It brought yeah. community within the restaurant, community together, and pretty soon servers were coming, everything else. But then all of a sudden the servers are bringing their mom, or you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like it was really awesome because all of a sudden it's like 11.30 till one in the morning. It's like people like, I went home and took a nap, you know, at seven o'clock right. and I woke up at 10 o'clock so I could come and hang out. Yeah. Um, and it was it was extremely fun, like we would have the last person, I remember the last person in line. Mm -hmm. So we would count where time period and be like, okay, we only have this many bowls left. And we would run out and we went to the hardware store and got one of those clothes signs. And then, <laughs> and then we, we wrapped it with plast saran wrap. And then we'd run out to the end of the line and we'd hang it on the last guy. Oh, that I didn't and then, know. <laughs> and then it'd be like, we're really busy inside. If anybody comes to the line, tell them we're sorry, we're out. Like, yeah. the shit out of luck. We don't have any more, like, that's it. <laughs> Uh, but it, and it was fun, you know, and it was fun, I think, for us at that time period to show that we could have a, a restaurant and uh, maybe not a one pony show. Like we yeah. aren't just a 20 seat tasting menu only extremely high end fancy restaurant. We also have a really good time and we make ramen and we can do other, you know, other things and we want to bring the community together. And it was a great time and a place because if you we were friends with Justin and that's so we knew about it, but it was, you know, if you were in, and it wasn't an in crowd, but if like you were lucky enough to hear about it, it was kind of magical, and you knew it wouldn't last forever because it couldn't because it was a twenty-three seat restaurant, right. <laughs> and it was gonna blow the walls out. We well, came after like year two, and the spot next to us opened up, and we were transitioning in. Me and the employees, and I was fortunate. 
most of my employees are still there. And uh, at that time, it was Dan, my front house manager at that time. He's growing with me now. But we looked at each other and we're like, you know, we're really pathetic. And I was like, what are you talking about? And then like, I started thinking, I was like, we literally just opened up our college basement house party and we decided to serve ramen out of it. Right. Like we are completely pathetic. We're in our thirties <laughs> and all we wanted to do was sit out and have a house, college house party in our basement and serve ramen and beer. It was time to, it was time that ramen got his own shop after yeah. that. Grew up. All right. So we're going to put this together. Because otherwise, we'll keep on talking so you, about So nothing. you strained everything through. We strained everything through. You put it into the so aerator. We put it into Little these CO, are wonderful CO2 cartridge. whipped cream canisters. Yep. A lot of places use them to make instant whipped cream. Doing it by hand is still better, but these are really nice for other things, like potato soup. Um, so we, do, we put a lot of things into these, actually. And it's just a thickener. Where you want more of this mouthfeel and richness to it. Um, and this will aerate and kind of hold it as, as stable. So the potatoes thicken the cream, obviously, which is going to help it get a little more body. Um, seasoned up is going to be the yeast in it. Uh, the dish-wise, we're going to put the relish down at the bottom. Um, the thought behind the relish is obviously this is going to be very rich, you know, fat-based for the most part, cream-based. Um, you want something that is going to be spicy and acidic and kind of counteract the richness of the cream. Um, is why we, we made the relish. So you just put a little small dollop in the bowl. It's really fancy. Can you guys see this? Yeah, they can see it on that, that oh. camera. It's one of these cameras. See? Did I mention see? he went to Madison College? Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> the culinary program. Yeah. Sparta is rated really high in the state, too. <laughs> uh, so relish down at the bottom. Uh, in theory, we want to cover it all. How cool is that? Everybody needs one of these. That and a little blowtorch. Um, but then when you eat it, you know, obviously you want to taste in the cream and everything else, but then when you go all the way down to the bottom of the bowl, then it's covered. You get all the acidity and all the brightness and everything. So this it kind is of mixes the ash, together. Right? And this is the ash mix, and then we just. Super simple, right? So the thing that I love about this dish, and as it's based on brandad, potato soup as well. I mean, these are these are peasant dishes. All great food is based on poor people food. Uh, salt cod was something that was shipped from basically Newfoundland and Nova Scotia and that sort of thing. Uh, the, the English started sending ships over and salting cod and sending back long before the pilgrims actually came here. And it was something that worked in that whole you know triangle of trade. So it's a flavor that we know. Cream, if you were well off as a peasant, you had cream, but if you had cows, you had cream. And then, you know, it's just those other flavors of balance. But this is something that if you've got Eastern European, or excuse me, European blood at all, sure. you know and there's things that we have, like yeah, we have flavors. Potatoes, we have beans, yep. we grow peppers, we yeah. grow onions. Yeah, potatoes. it just makes sense. Yeah. Exactly, we're from just, the dairy state. You just did it through one of these crazy yeah. things. You yeah. just get one of these <laughs> things and it changes your world. It's yeah. going great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that's it. That's it. And perfectly timed. Voila. Yeah. The instructors of Madison College are coming through the door with your own personal dish of this potato soup. Is it? Yeah. It doesn't look full. Yeah, yeah. Boom. All right, I'm going to go out. Does anyone have questions? I hope you do. Yeah? All right, I'm going to go out and raise your hand as you're being served. Okay. Wait till I get to you with the mic. Okay. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Do yeah. you play music for your cattle? Or your My father does, yes. What kind? Uh, I, he's in Sparta, does country. Does that make a difference? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we only have one radio station. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, yeah, WCOW, right? <laughs> Cow 97. Do you um, have maybe for Yeah, no, not too much, but he, you know, it's the philosophy, and we do raise a uh, majority of the Japanese style, uh, the Wagus is what we raise, red and black Wagus, Angus, and Semental. Uh, the Wagus obviously take longer, but yeah, he, I don't, it's, it's pretty outstanding to see him. Like, he has little forts made for him with, like, his old blue jeans that are, like, have the fly spray on them so they can walk underneath it and they don't get flies. He buys all the street cleaner brushes from the city 
and then puts them on poles so they have back scratchers. Yep. So they can brush um, again. Yeah, yeah. We have two donkeys that protect them, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's, you know, it's magical and it's wonderful because he truly loves doing it, you know? Yeah. And it's, you know, he's, he's not young, he's 76. Um, and he took this on from, in theory, being semi-retired and just kind of hanging out and had the cattle we had to, it's full blown, all he does now is strictly raise beef for our restaurant. Any other questions? I'm just curious, uh, how do you prepare steaks without a hood or, uh, or all, being all electric? Sure, uh, we still go through an aging process. Um, and I guess there's a debate, and uh, Kevin at the school is testing some of our thoughts right now. Um, so when we get the animals in, we age it traditionally with fans still, but a little bit of salt and everything. We age it roughly about nine, eight, nine weeks, two months. Um, and then I completely coat them in aged beef fat. Um, completely, seal them all off. Uh, and then we age out for another 100 days, 90 days, roughly. Uh, so they're in between the, the 90 day ballpark-ish before we serve them. Um, one of the instructors wise, pulled one of those out, by the way, and it looked like the weirdest baked Alaska I've ever seen. Yeah, right, it was like baked Alaska. <laughs> Just saying. Um, but preparation-wise, that's a lot of the process. It gets tender still, just like so normally aging. I don't agree with the large ammoniated flavor profile. You get on a, a long age to it. If I want to add blue cheese to it, I'll put blue cheese on the steak. Um, but then it was also, I lose less water concentrate and it's a lot more beefier flavor. We then take the, it off. Once we clean it, we're getting ready to use it. We'll take it and we'll break it into what we call logs or sections. Um, then we'll let that age at least overnight so it kind of gets a little bit of a drier surface. Um, and then super simple preparation. We will uh, take it outside, grill down a Weber grill in the alleyway, um, and then bring it back inside. Uh, <laughs> And then we put it in a vacuum seal bag. We run almost everything off vacuum sealers and circulators and everything. Um, and we cook it at roughly 52 or roughly 130 degrees. And the timing is all depending on the cut. Like a ribeye is an hour and a half. Um, short ribs are 48 hours. Um, so that's all, that's how, it, and then we'll bring it out during service when we're cooking it. Salt, pepper, and then we have this magical device uh, for those at the modernist cuisine. Does everybody know what the modernist cuisine is, right? They make a pizza stone, right? And it's like this big cast iron metal block. If you put one of those on an induction burner, it turns into a French flat top that now you can run multiple pans off of, but then you can also sear multiple pieces of beef on it. Uh, so we do that. We just sear it on a flat top, and that's it. Um, and we always brush, brush the, the open face area or the slices with the fat of the animal that we serve. Hmm. Uh, just helps kind of give it more of a richer flavor. But yeah. simple, we don't, no, the, the, oh, yeah, the beef, the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but we want, we don't want to flavor it or anything else, you know, my father works extremely hard to make it delicious. That's Great. A, yeah, we got, yeah, yeah, Let me, uh, yes. I'm going to go to this uh, gal over here and then to you, sir. First of all, the soup was outstanding. We enjoyed it. Oh my God. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Call thank, up on the counter. Yeah, thank all of them. They're wonderful and did it in back. Uh, second of all, uh, what kinds, typically, what kinds of vegan options do you offer or serve? What kind of vegan options? Yeah, what do you serve when somebody um, is a vegan? Sure, if you, uh, let's say, I'm trying to think of, was it two nights ago or last week? Days kind of run together. Last week, we had a vegan come in. Um, so, like, starting off snacks. Um, we always do two little snacks and roughly a beverage or a tea to start off with when you sit down at the restaurant. Um, so we did, to that we almost, we had one savory macaroon for the vegan. We made a savory macaroon but we dried and puffed broccoli with a broccoli filling on the inside. Um, and then we did like a small potato salad kind of with marinated and pressurized potatoes, mustard seeds. And then we finish off our tea is vegan. Uh, we make a Japanese style tea out of a lot of ingredients from Wisconsin, um, gimacha style tea, um, which is a green style, but it has a lot of roasted rice in it. So what we do is we make it out of wild rice. Uh, wild rice, apples, pears, um, a lot of the veg and fruits from Wisconsin, and we'll make that tradition. Um, and then we'll just have, that's the starter that it came in. Um, what do we got this year? 
First course, we a normal person will on the menu right now will get. I'm gonna go through the whole menu if you all right. All right, uh, we'll go through. It'll be um, uh, barbecued eel mousseline wrapped in salted uh, zucchini with paddlefish roe on it. But we want you to have a mimic savor, so now we have salted zucchini um, with on the inside. Then we'll almost make a tofu out of the zucchini. We'll make milk out of the guts of the zucchini and then inoculate it and make tofu out of it and then whip it um, and then put that back in and then we will take almost a uh, salt potato mixture and burn it with ash and make drops out of it and now that will mimic the caviar and it can make your saltiness so you get the same dish profile. Um, the next dish it will be our beef tartare on the menu. You would get carrot so we make a carrot miso and then we make a hummus out of the carrot miso um, and we have charred barbecued carrots, pickled carrots, raw carrots, dried and puffed coriander seeds. Um, so that's the vegan course option. Um, next course after that, this menu is easy. So we have um, confit red cabbage. One person will get confit red cabbage with dried pears, uh, smoked ham, mustard seeds, pork sauce, sauerkraut powder. The other person will pretty much get the same thing without smoked ham. Uh, the next course after that is going to be uh, braised uh, acorn squash and koji. Take that out and then we season it with sorghum. Um, and then the non-vegan is going to get uh, puff amaranth, dried honey, and dried and smoked duck leg or duck katsubushi. Same, you know, vegan's going to get same thing without the duck. Um, of course after that is uh, right now matsutake soup, uh, pine mushroom. So they're good on either side on that one. Um, and then finally off beef. Right now the beef prep is going to be beef with um, pickled kohlrabi. We make sheets out of kohlrabi and pickle it in dill. And then we will do a smoked oyster cream with confit shallots off to the side. And it's kind of like your little bit dip. Uh, we'll turn around and we'll do uh, marinated koji and kohlrabi. And then we will almost juice onions. Onions have a fat to them but within the skin layers. Um, so we will submerge that into it and slow cook it and then caramelize it so we almost get a real meaty flavor to it. And then a lot of the same plate except we'll do a smoked tofu with it, with shallots. Um, desserts are okay because our desserts, um, outside the cream base that's on it, but it's gonna be our first one is tapioca um, with blueberries cooked down in licorice. Um, and then there's like a dried lilac cream cheese on top. And then the other side will just will take the dried lilacs because they're actual lilacs and we'll just whip them. I um, mean, make a cream cheese out of mimic it kind of. And on the ass, we always laugh at our pastry chef because pretty much to me like dirt cake. It's awesome, I told you I need gummy worms for it. Um, <laughs> but um, it's like a sour plum with a cascara, which is smoked shells of coffee steeped in the cream and piped around. So we'll just do that, but then we'll get like um, the lactose free and the sour, the vegan sour creams and all that kind of stuff and do that on it. Um, and we even get it down to the, if you have a dairy allergy, like we won't obviously use white chocolates. We won't use different chocolate contents depending on the fat contents of it because obviously it's a dairy allergy and that could affect something. Wow. Um, you this person. Let's do, uh, let's do, what am I, uh, about two more questions and then we'll let, uh, head on with the evening. Yes, yes. sir. Yes. Um, I know I want to go back to the steak thing. I got yeah. a sous vide a year and a half ago. Sure. I love it. It's yeah. terrific. But um, I noticed that you said you take the meat and, and char it on the Weber first and then put it in and uh, then char it again after. Why? Yeah. Why? In part flavor. Just to impart, really? yeah, uh, the smoke flavor. Um, a lot of times when you go into the bag and you've probably noticed like you have liquid left over, I mean it's just going to condensate or whatever, you're going to lose a lot of that initial flavor profile um, or that char or sear if you seared it before you went into the bag, you're going to lose that when you're cooking it in the bag. So in theory I just want to crisp it back up at the end. In the beginning I want to impart the charcoal flavor. Yeah. We have come in now where we make charcoal oil and we just put the oil in the bag. I don't have to grill it. Uh, 
First of all, I wanted to thank you for coming tonight. I'm an instructor at Madison College. Thank you guys for having me. This is just great. Giggles, actually. I mean, I'm a chemistry teacher, so that's... <laughs> it's <laughs> it's, like, it's the same online. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> There's a culinary link, too, but um, I wasn't familiar with your background, and so I'm just blown away by your history, your connections, your... Thank you. Um, your, you know... Way to make me feel awkward. <laughs> I think it's so amazing to see how many places you've been and how many people you've worked with and how many um, connections you've made. So I'm actually kind of curious what you're hoping to do in the future. Who do you want to work with? Who are you dying to collaborate with? And, I want to and not cook anymore in 10 years and stay at home with my wife. There you go. That's an awesome plan, too. That's what I want. Yeah. She, but, I mean, I want to do lots of things, but that's my end goal. My wife has dealt with me in this being away and everything else and everybody has a significant other and if I can make a wonderful thing out of what I'm doing right now and be able to be home, that's the only goal. Um, till then, I want, I want to pass something on to others that work with me. I want them to feel that what they want to do, they can achieve it, no matter how weird it is or how crazy the thought process it is. And if you want to open a 20 seat restaurant in the basement, then you can do this. Um, you know, but I want them to be a part of it, but I also want them to realize that their surroundings is completely part of who they are and they need to express that. Um, you, if, if, I if I would have lost my love for my parents and where I grew up, then I don't think and Kyle might be able to answer because he's more on the other side than me, but it wouldn't be as meaningful. Like this cooking for a living, you want to please people. You know, I try to say it, you know, off our business is that you know, I, I don't discuss myself as a restaurateur or as a chef. I provide a service. I want somebody to come in and buy this service. I'm the same as a doctor or probably a hooker. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's, it can go on either side. Wow. But, but for me to have emotions and share those emotions with my service, now my service is getting isolated out to being a very special service and a very service that people sought after and want to dine with us. And I want my individuals that work with me at all the restaurants to be a part of that, to feel those emotions, to have these thoughts of what they want to do in life and be proud of where they came from and what they have, whether you came from being extremely poor in the city or if you came from being a hillbilly in Sparta, Wisconsin. You know, it, it doesn't matter. We can all achieve things, and, but we also all have effects on people that we deal with. I affect every customer that comes into it, and I want the customer to know that I take that extremely, extremely honorable and personal. Um, and I want my cooks to know that too, not to be the cooks that take maybe it for granted, or take restaurants for granted, or restaurant oh. tours for granted, or even what we deal with, or take a chicken for granted. Like we're getting to the day and age that we needed to start respecting things again, and I want to pass that along. Thank you, Chef. Uh, a huge thank you to Madison College for having this series. In particular, Chef Paul Short, who's in the back, who's really been the driving force. Brian, Brian Woodhouse is uh, hiding out in the wings here. Uh, just so great. Um, Dr. Daniels, who's the grand poobah of this organization, who just empowers people to, to, to make this happen. Um, Justin just saying yes when I called him, he basically just said, let me check my calendar, but I'm in. Yeah, I'm a little busy, but this is yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the AV department, uh, fantastic. Um, Volrath for, for partnering with us. Couldn't, couldn't pull us together without them. And uh, for all of you, for being here. Um, this is your evidencing paying it forward. This is something that's happening tonight, but then we'll live through this recording and will be available to culinary students really for generations. And that's all on Madison College and Chef uh, Short, which is just fantastic. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. And thank uh, you everybody. Yeah. So much. Yeah. Thank you.